So in the previous video, we were looking at extraoral or intraoral assessment. Another type of assessment we do in clinic is the hard tissue assessment, dental charting. So one of the things we'll look at in the in um actually later on is in this video is biologically sound and functional dentition. This is one of the um, human needs that we need to look at in more detail. What, one thing that is important to note is in this human need, biologically sound and functional dentition, what we're looking at is to see if someone has any cavities, to see if someone has any damage, teeth da tooth damage, to see if they have any developmental anomalies. Because if they do, we need to address that in the care plan. We need to address that in a care plan underneath, under the biologically sound and functional uh, human need. So when we do a hard tissue charting or a dental charting, we are documenting everything. It could be in paper or it could be like this electronically. This is a graphic, this is a dental charting. This is a graphic representation of the patient's um, teeth on a specific date. And then we update it regularly. We're, put, we're noting down all the restorations. We're noting down the exact location of the teeth. If there's any drifting, if there's any uh, you know, tilting, rotation, all that is recorded in the dental charting. Electronic charting is honestly um, a great option because it saves space in the in your office. It is readily available and it allows for um, incorporation of digital radiographic images. So you could put like, uh, you could use the intraoral camera and incorporate and put that into, your fi into the file. Same with digital radiographs. You could all incorporate it all in one in one file electronically. However, the downside is it is expensive. There is a learning curve. It's not easy to learn all this as you see here. There's so many different options you can do. Um, so that is the downside. However, more and more offices are turning and switching to electronic charting. Now, when you um, do heart tissue charting, it's really important that you have basic knowledge of T classification. Primary teeth, ha there are 20. Secondary or permanent teeth, we have 32. The key difference, what is the key difference between primary and secondary when you look at the number of teeth they have? We know that primary has less than secondary. Another uh, key thing is that secondary teeth or permanent teeth have premolars. Primary teeth do not have premolars, so the ones in yellow. No premolars in primary teeth. These um, Molars that are in primary teeth become, they come out and they re and the premolars replace those. Molars here, there are two in per quadrant, whereas in permanent dentition, we have three molars. We can divide the mouth into four, that is quadrants. We can also divide the mouth into six, and that is sectants. Now, I know you guys all know what mesials and distals are, but we can, did you know that you can also divide the, the tooth into three? So we have the incise, if we're looking at the incisor teeth, we have the incisal third, we can have the middle third and the gingival third. And we can also do that for the posterior teeth where we have, Hmm, doesn't say that here. Okay, so we, we're actually um, looking at it vertically in this one, but you can also look at it um, horizontally where you have the occlusal third, the middle third, and the gingival third or cervical third. In this um, picture, what we're seeing is we see the mesial, we see the distal, and we see the middle third. One fun fact that I want to point out is look at how the roots are curving. Roots almost always, if they if there is a curve, it would curve to the distal side. So if you're ever unsure, um, you know, if it's the right or left, look at the, the, the curve of the root and you can figure out that if it curves distally, you know that that is this side over here is the distal side. Apical is towards the apex of the root, middle is right here, and cervical means along the neck, along the neck of the tooth, which is right here, cervical third. Tooth numbering systems are important to note for the board exam. So uh, in Canada, we use the FDI or the international numbering system, but in the States, for example, they may use the universal numbering system. Palmer notation is also a, another notation to note. So let's look at the key differences. 
When we look, this is primary teat, and you can tell because they, there's only 20 teat, and there's no premolars. So universal numbering, what they do for primary teat is they note that in alphabets. So you start with the upper right, and you go all the way down to um, the bottom, and it's noted alphabetically in order. So A, B, C, right, all the way down to T. With FDI, what you'll notice is you'll see two numbers. The first number refers to the quadrant. The second number refers to the number of the tooth number in that quadrant. So for example, when we're looking at primary dentition, we have quad 5, quad 6, quad 7, quad 8. And so if you look at 5, 5, 1, 5 is the fifth quadrant. That's what it refers to. And 1 refers to the first tooth in that quadrant. This is quad 7, this is quad 5, quad 6, quad 7, and again, when you look at this number 7, 7 refers to it's in quadrant 7, and 5 refers to it's the fifth tooth in that quadrant. And Palmer notation, the way you do it is you box it um, depending on which arc it is at. So if you look at this one, for example, this is on the top right, so you have to box it like this to show that it's not on the top right. If you do the top left, it would look like this. And then you put the appropriate number here. So this is D, which indicates that this is the first molar. So every tooth, A for the first tooth, B for the second tooth, has its own letter. Every tooth has its own letter. So all incisors, central incisors, are given A. All lateral incisors are given the letter B, and so on and so forth. And the same thing applies for the um, permanent teeth. We could do universal, we could use universal numbering where you start with 1 and you end all the way and it goes in clockwise motion to 32 and every tooth has their own number. If you have a missing um, or extracted wisdom teeth, this is not number 1, this will still be 1. So this is number 1, this is number 2, this is number 3 and so on. FDI, we have quad 1, quad 2, quad 3, quad 4. The first number refers to the quadrant. The second number refers to the tooth number. So this is tooth number 8, the wisdom teeth, the third molar. And that's the, the number there. Important thing to note is to differentiate the universal with the FDI. With universal, we can say 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 for tooth numbers. But with FDI, we must say 2, 6. 2, 5. We don't say 26, 25. That's how we can differentiate um, that. So when we say 2, 5, the first number refers to the quadrant. The second number refers to the number of the, the fifth number of tooth within that quadrant. Nomenclature. This is important. So when you are identifying a, a tooth, what you want to be mindful of is nomenclature. Follow the DAQT system. So D for dentition, A for R, Q for quadrant, T for tooth. So here's an example. Dentition refers to is it primary or is it permanent? So here we have permanent. Arc refers to is it maxillary or mandibular? Here we have mandibular. Quadrant refers to is it right or is it left? Here we have right. And tooth refers to well, which tooth is it? first premolar. So this is a great example of nomenclature where we have identified the tooth using the DAQT system. This is an example of permanent teeth and this is a tooth and this is an example of primary tooth. If your client is in pain and you want to find out more about it, Remember, we were talking about open-ended questions, so try to ask as many open-ended questions as possible. So tell me about your pain is good instead of do you have pain? Do you have pain is a yes or no, but tell me about your pain. You're encouraging them to elaborate. And you can see in this um, slide, there's many different questions you can ask because you want to ask them about how intense it is. Is it mild, moderate, severe? Get them to rank it on a scale of 1 to 10, for example. Get them to point out to it. Get them to tell you how long it lasts. Get them to tell you when this pain happens. Is it when you're lying down or is it when you're bent over? And then what is the quality of that pain? Is it sharp? Is it dull? Is it stabbing? Is it throbbing? You need all that information so that when the dentist comes over to do a check, you can relay that information to him or her. Now, how do you check for cavities? How do you check for caries? 
Well, you could look at it directly, so you could do a direct visual examination, and sometimes we can tell when you see a hole on the, you know, in the tooth, you know. You could do transillumination, which is where you shine a light uh, through the tooth, and when you shine a light through the tooth, if you see some darkening, it could be a carry, it could be caries. You could do tactile clinical examination where you use an explorer and you you, uh, you put the explorer in that area where you see a cavity. No longer recommended though. And the reason why it's no longer recommended is because let's say you find a cavity and you're poking it with an explorer and then you take that explorer and you take you put it somewhere else and you poke something else. Well, now you've just taken the bacteria from that carious lesion, the initial carious lesion, and you're you're putting it elsewhere. So it's not exactly an ideal thing to do anymore. Radiographs are huge. Radiograph will tell you um, if there are any caries on the interproximal or occlusal region. And then, tell, you know, go by what the client tells you. If the client is saying they're in pain, then, um, you know, figure out where they're in pain. And, and that can also help you narrow down what the reason is for the pain. Is it caries or is it something else? We also, when we do a heart tissue charting, we're not only looking for caries, we're also looking for tooth damage. And we need to chart those accordingly onto the um, dental chart or the heart tissue chart. So sometimes if they're grinding like crazy, you can get attrition. If they are grinding or, and um, clenching a lot over time, you can get a fraction. This is severe a fraction that can happen over time with grinding and clenching, with bruxism. If they have an acidic diet, it could wear away their teeth. If they have acid reflux, it could cause erosion as well. And then abrasion is if they're brushing really, really hard, it can it can cause abrasion. So when you're into checking for cavities, there are many different types of cavities. There are early childhood caries, which just means cavities that children get if they're under the age of five and you see caries, they fall under the early childhood carry categories. Rampant caries are where you see sudden, where you see a huge rapid um, amount of destruction on the teeth that requires urgent, you know, immediate attention. That's rampant caries like that, where, oh, where the poor child has cavities almost everywhere. Chronic caries, that's our, our typical, you know, uh, case where you would see, this is extreme, but where you see a decay and progresses slowly. Chronic means slow, right? So you see a cavity that is progressing slowly. Arrested, this could be considered as an arrested caries where, um, you know, caries started happening. There was a cavity and then all of a sudden the cavity stopped growing. So now it's starting to get remineralized. It's starting to, the enamel is starting to heal the area. So arrested is when it stops progressing, when the cavity has stopped from progressing. And recurrent caries, this is an example of recurrent caries. You had a cavity, you got that restored, and now you have a cavity underneath that restoration. That's known as recurrent or secondary caries. Now, when you look at um, a tooth, let's see if I can draw it in perhaps hello so it stands out more. So here we have um, a molar, for example. When you have a cavity right here on the pit and fissure, that's called a pit and fissure caries. When you have cavities on the mesial or on the distal, that is called proximal caries because it's on the interproximal region. If you have cavities on the buccal or on the lingual side, um, it could also even be on the mesial or distal. Sometimes we call that smooth surface caries. And then root caries is if you see cave caries or cavities on the root. Now, when you're classifying caries, there are two ways of classifying. You could classify it using the black classification system. You could also classify it using the complexity classification system. So let's start with this one. Complexity, complexity classification system is when you identify cavities based on the, how many surfaces have been affected. So for example, if you find a cavity, so if you see a cavity, let's draw this again, and it's just on the occlusal surface, that is considered simple, over occlusal. It was just on the occlusal surfaces. If you find um, a cavity and it's on the mesial occlusal, so the cavity is on the mesial and the occlusal side, and you have two surfaces involved, that is called a compound because there's two surfaces in, um, involved. So MO, this is an MO caries. And complex is when you have three or more surfaces. So let's say the distal was also affected. So now we have mesial, occlusal, 
and distal surface affected, and that is considered complex caries. MOD in this example. M for mesial, O for occlusal, D for distal. Here's a question for you guys. According to GB's Black classifications um, of dental restoration, what type of dental restoration is an amalgam filling located on the occlusal surface of tooth 15? Notice I said tooth 15. 15 means it's not 1-5, it's 15. 15 is universal numbering system. The FDI for this is 2-7. So occlusal surface, that is a class one. So let's look at the black classification. If you have, so this is class one, if you have an occlusal filling or a filling right here on the lingual, that is class one. Class two is when you have interproximal class on the molars um, or posterior teeth. Class three is interproximal on the anterior teeth. Class 4 is when you have it on the incisal ridge, also in the interproximal region. So 2, 3, 4 all include interproximal regions. Class 5 is along the cervical, along the neck of the tooth, where you do a restoration along the neck of the tooth. And class 6 is when you do it on the cusp. It can also be when you do it on the incisal ridge as well. Okay, that's class 6. So be familiar with the GB Black classification. So caries detection, how can you detect for caries? Well, we kind of touched on this, but remember, you can look at it visually, do a visual um, assessment and check um, for where it is, what color it is, and you know what the surface feels like, what the texture is. Radiographs are huge. Bite wings and PAs are excellent tools for checking for caries. Remember we said Explorer is no longer recommended because you can transfer bacteria, karyogenic bacteria to other areas. And intraoral cameras, use that to your advantage. Take pictures, be um, proactive. When you, before you, the dentist comes in for a check, have all the pictures of, um, take intraoral pictures of all the areas you're concerned about so that you can bring it up to the dentist. The dentist would be so impressed. If you have a big cavity that has progressed through the pulp, um, it can create an abscess. And that's when you need to do a root canal. Once it hits the pulp and creates an abscess, that's a, a, a huge problem. And now you have to do, a, the client needs a root canal, which is even um, more costly for them. There are many developmental anomalies that can be found um, on the uh, on your client's teeth and it's important to be familiar with that because that's something that you may want to chart and notify in their like you do want to chart and, and document in their uh in your client's chart so i have a video on dental anomalies it's 13 minutes long but it looks at all the different anomalies like hyperdontia mesiodense fusion hyperdontia right all the different anomalies are shown with images in that video so i do encourage you guys to have a look at that video that looks at the different anomalies. All right, let's look at occlusion now. So another thing that we always document in the heart tissue section is occlusion. And so for occlusion, what we want to note is, um, well, actually what we should be mindful of is what's, what is their centric occlusion? What does that look like? So centric occlusion is when they close, how does it look like? What does the, the, what is the relationship of the max teeth to the man teeth when they close in a normal, um, in a fully closed position? So when the jaws are fully closed, that is centric occlusion. Centric relation is when you're just looking at the, um, the jaw placement when you're just looking at the bone okay so when you're looking at how the mandible jaw and the maxilla jaw um, are placed more specifically you're looking at the condyle which is right here so there are three different types of classifications there's class one class two and class three let's look at them so class one what do we see in class one class one is when you have the mesial buccal cusp of the first molar aligned with the mesial buccal groove of the first molar. Do you see that? The cusp over here is aligned with the groove. Now what happens in class two is where you get when you get the mandibular teeth shifted in. And you can see that the mandibular teeth have been shifted in, pushed in, and now the mesial buccal groove is distal, is behind 
the cusp. In class three, the mesial buccal group is ahead, is mesial to the mesial buccal cusp of the maxillary first molar. So class one is when they align, when the buccal, mesial buccal group align with the group. Class two is when the group has been pushed distal. Class three is when this group has been pushed mesial. You can also assess it with the canine relationship. So if people are missing the first molar, you can also assess it with the canine relationship and look at the canine in relationship. Um, so you would look at the position of this canine in relationship to the max canine. Now, when you have malocclusion, so class one, again, class one is when they align. So when the mesial buccal cusp align with the mesial um, buccal group, Malocclusion means something is wrong, something else is wrong. So you could have crowding, you could have an overbite, you could have an end bite, end to end bite or cross bite. So let's look at this. Let's say your client is biting completely and there's an open bite right here. This could be because they're a tongue thruster, this could be because they suck their thumbs. And so when they bite down, you see an open area that is open bite. If they bite down normally when they're biting down like normal and they have um, this end-to-end -end bite where they're uh, occluding, the maxillary teeth are occluding with the mandibular teeth without overlapping. There's no overlap. Typically what happens is the max overlaps demand, max overlaps demand. That's not happening here. That is end-to-end -end bite. This is cross bite because remember, as I said, typically what happens is the maxillary teeth come out, mandibular teeth are in, and here we see the opposite where it's not end to end, but we see the max in, mand out, that is considered a cross bite. Again, mand is out, max is in, cross bite, because typically it's the other way around. Now when someone has class two occlusion, so remember class two occlusion is when you have, I'll review that slide one more time, because it's really important you know that, when the mesial buccal groove is distal okay so when you have that distal um, inclination so the mesial buccal groove is distal to the mesial buccal cusp now if someone has class 2 occlusion you could have division 1 or division 2 so you need to specify what type of division is it division 1 is when the when the front teeth when the maxillary incisors are you know they protrude facially they're normal but division 2 is when you get this happening when the maxillary central incisors are retruded are inclined that is class 2 division 2 and class 3 Class three is, again, I'll show you that picture so we can visually see it. Class three is when the mesial buccal group is ahead, mesial, to the mesial buccal cusp. Now, in primary teeth, we can also assess for occlusion. So when you have a, a child that's coming to you, we check for primary occlusion. What we like to see, what is ideal, is when you have a flush terminal plane where the maxillary and mandibular second molars, they can either occlude an end-to-end -end bite or you can get the um, mandibular second molar is mesial to the uh, primary maxillary second molar. So you can get this step when the molar is mesial to the um, maxillary second molar so you're looking at the second molar and it's uh, mesial so again just to recap when, when we're checking for primary occlusion we are checking for second molar we're looking at the second molar not the first the second molar and when we're looking at the second molar we want to see what the relationship is and if you see this type of relationship or this relationship where the mand molar is mesial to the max second molar then that's normal that's ideal we like that this is is when you see a distal step so this is called mesial step. This is called distal step when the mand molar, second molar, is distal to the max second molar. That is distal step. And this is not ideal, but these two are ideal. The word parafunctional is an important word because parafunctional, what that refers to is when you're using your teeth with them um, and you're not using your teeth to chew so all of these are examples of parafunctional habits 
Functional is when you're using it to chew, because functional is we use our teeth normally to chew. But parafunctional is when you're subconsciously using your teeth for reasons other than chewing. So clenching, when you're biting down really hard. Bruxism, that's like grinding. When you're a thumb suck, you know, a thumb or finger sucking or rocking of the teeth when you're playing with your teeth, those are all parafunctional habits and they can cause extreme damage to your to the dentition. Let's look at the difference between primary trauma and secondary trauma. Primary trauma is let's say you're grinding like crazy and um, you're grinding in an area that has no previous bone loss. Okay, so this has never been um, altered because of periodontitis and no bone loss in that area. And now you're grinding and causing damage to an area that has not been previously affected by periodontitis. Secondary trauma is you're grinding to in an area that has already been affected by periodontitis. See how the bone level is intact in primary trauma and now in secondary trauma the bone level has been reduced. It has been reduced because of previous periodontal disease, because of previous periodontitis. So when you are grinding or clenching and putting a lot of pressure on the occlusal surfaces, you're going to do damage to that area. And if you're doing damage to an area that has already been damaged before because of periodontitis, that is considered secondary trauma. Okay, let's move on to dental hygiene diagnosis, which is chapter 22 of the fifth edition of Darby. So again, remember we did assessment where we're collecting data and now we're going to move on to diagnosis. And diagnosis is when you're interpreting and analyzing the data that you have collected here. And then you're going to figure out, okay, what is wrong with that client and how can we help that client? So when you come up with a dental hygiene diagnosis, it's important to look at all the assessment data and identify. It's also important to figure out what their client's attitude is uh, towards dental care. Are they willing to change or are they not willing to change? And then based on that, you can help them. Um, and what you're trying to do is come up with a client specific care plan or treatment plan. Care plan is actually a better word. You may want to collaborate with their doctors and other, in, you know, other professionals to come up with a dental hygiene diagnosis. So what do you do? Well, the first thing you do when you create a care plan is you analyze all and interpret all their assessment data. So you're going to like highlight the red flags. What are the areas you're concerned about? Then you come up with a dental hygiene diagnosis. And then you're going to tell your client that dental hygiene diagnosis. And then you're going to determine, you know, which ones you can you can actually help so which one as a hygienist we can fix so if they have cavities you might want to refer them to a dentist because that's not within our scope so determine what you can do for dental hygiene care how you can help them in within your scope of practice and then make referrals if the referrals are needed for you know areas that you can't help out with like caries for example or you know seeing a social worker because they're under uh, a lot of financial stress then you send out those referrals so the human needs model, the, there are eight human needs, and I don't have all of them here. I'm going to show you where they are over here. Okay, here we go. There are eight human needs that we need to be mindful of, and these are all related to oral health and disease. And it's important that we are familiar with what all of these mean, and I'm going to go over them shortly with you, because when you find from the assessment data, when you find um, information, when you find red flags, for example, you can put them under specific categories. So before I go over this, let's look at this question. Formulating the dental hygiene diagnosis statement involves which of the following? So I'll let you have a read and you tell me what you think. I'm hoping you said A, identification of the, the condition and problem. So first you're going to identify the problem. I'll show you what that looks like. Then you're going to figure out what the contributing factors are, what caused that problem, and then what signs and symptoms are there that relates to that problem. So let me show you um, an example. So when you come up with a treatment plan, once you identify the, the unmet human need, which I'll go over in a bit, what you then need to do is you need to figure out what caused 
what are the contributing factors and what are the signs and symptoms? So what are the co contributing factors? What cause that deficit? And how, what are the signs and symptoms that cause that, you know, that, that is related to that deficit? So we're going to look at some examples of this. But before I do that, let's look at this. These are the eight unmet human needs. These are the eight human needs that are important. And so let's look at protection from health risk. Health risk is anything, protection from health risk is if they are not seeing a, um, a doctor, for example, and because their BP is outside of normal limits and you're concerned and they have to go see a doctor. So anytime they're, you have health issues, you put them in, in this category. So BP outside of normal limits. They need pre-med. So this is something we have to put under because they fall, these are all health risks. They're at risk for bacteremia. They're at risk for hypertension. Um, they could be at risk for injury. So any risk factor puts them in this category. Skin and mucous membrane, this is where you see swelling, you see plaque index, you know, that are high, you see deep pockets, any cows, uh, dry mouth, anything to do with the, the skin and mucus, anything to do with the mucous membrane. So think about gums, think about buccal mucosa, think about tongue, all that falls under here. Any red flags that you found relating to the mucous membrane, so the tongue, the buccal mucosa, all that, that falls, the gums, that falls under here. So bleeding. Freedom from fear and stress. If they tell you they are very stressed about coming here, if they have concerns about fluoride, mercury from amalgam fillings, um, infection control, they're concerned about, they're really stressed and anxious, you can put them in this category and then make a, make a goal to help them with this. Biologically sound and functional dentition, that is anything teeth related. So if they have overhangs, if they have missing teeth, you're going to recommend implants, you're going to recommend bridges, whatever it is for missing teeth that you want to recommend. Dentures, right? That's another one. If they have abrasion, erosion, abfraction, attrition, what can you do to help them with that? So anything teeth related cavities, they fall under biologically sound and functional dentition. Freedom from pain, that is another one. So if they're telling you they have pain in, uh, you know, on one side of their mouth or on specific areas of their teeth, you need to document that under freedom from pain so that we can make a goal pertaining to that. Conceptualization and problem solving, this is if they have no idea about, if they've never been taught, for example, about something. So if they've never been taught about periodontitis or gingivitis, never ever have they ever been told anything about oral disease, you put them here in conceptualization and problem solving. So they have questions for you about dental hygiene care, and this is where um, you could put them, you know, those deficits within, within this unmet human need, and then you can create a goal to help them understand everything, or understand all the, all the um, questions they have. So maybe they don't even know that, um, they don't even know anything about, let's say, oral disease or how, how cavities happen and they have no idea, they've never been taught. You can put that under here. Wholesome facial image. This is when the client themselves tell you they're unhappy with something. So maybe they're unhappy with how their teeth look. Maybe they're unhappy with how their gums look because it's so swollen. Maybe they're unhappy with their breath. They find that they have bad breath. This is not what you predict. This is what the client um, is telling you. And then lastly, responsibility for oral health. So if you find they have lots of plaque, if they find they have lots, you have, you know, they have lots of calculus. Um, if you find that they've never gone to a dentist in so many years, more than two years to be specific, you put them under responsibility for oral health. The difference between these two is responsibility for oral health is they know. They know they should be seeing a dentist regularly. They know they should be coming often Um Whereas in conceptualization and problem solving, they had no idea that they were supposed to come regularly, or they had no idea about the periodontal disease process, or they have no idea about the caries process. So responsibility for oral health, they know the importance, they just didn't have the time or money to do it, to come. And conceptualization and problem solving is they genuinely had no idea. So when you write a dental hygiene diagnosis, the first thing you do is you figure out what unmet human need they fall under. Then you figure out, well, what is the cause? And then you figure out what the signs and symptoms are. And then based on that, and I'll go over some examples, but based on that, then you can come up with a goal and you can, and you can figure out how you can help them with their, with their problems, how you can help them with their unmet human need.
Okay, so when you write a goal, I'm just going to click here. Okay, so when you write a goal, um, sorry, when you write a dental hygiene diagnosis, I should say, you come up with the, you figure out what the unmet human need is. So let's say a wholesome facial image. So this means a client has told you something that they're not happy about. So you come up with the cause. What is the cause? What caused this unmet human need? Well, what caused it was mobility. They, they, the, the client, um, you know, said that they are very, so this is a sign and symptom. Sign and symptom is what you see inside the mouth and what the client has told you. So here the client has told us that um, they're concerned that the front teeth are loose. So that's what's bothering the client. And how, what is the cause? Well, what caused this, the front teeth to be, you know, mobile? Well, there's class two mobility on the front teeth from periodontal disease. So it's a periodontal disease that caused this um, deficit and the sign and symptom is the client told you that skin and mucous membrane so skin and mucous membrane what do you see signs and symptoms are what do you see well you see bleeding on probing you see recession you see pockets right and what caused it well what caused it was the plaque was the calculus that caused um, all of these signs and symptoms that, that caused this unmet human need. Biologically sound and functional dentition, that means there's something wrong with the teeth itself. And you notice that when you, when you, the sign was when you looked inside, you saw they have lots of caries, they have active caries that you suspected and, or the dentist told you. And what caused it? Well, the, well, the cause was maybe dry mouth from medication. Maybe that the client had no idea what, what about the caries process and how to take care of their mouth when, um, you know, how to clean clean their mouth they don't know anything about the caries process so signs and symptoms are what you see ideology is what is what caused it serostomia for example in this case what caused it plaque and calculus caused all this bleeding and recession what caused the, the loose teeth well mobility because they, a periodontal disease mobility from periodontal disease right that's what caused um the front teeth to get loose once you have identified the dental hygiene diagnosis, once you've written it out, then you have to come up with a goal for each and every single one. And you can have multiple goals for each type of um, deficit. So that's very common. People have three or five goals per, um, you know, per deficit. Motivational interviewing is really important. So when you're presenting the care plan to your client, don't just tell them everything. Collaborate. Get them to participate. Get them to um, give feedback. Get them to help you come up with strategies because that is the best way to allow them to, um, to get a positive response. You need to allow them to take part and take control of the uh, treatment. When you do a dental hygiene diagnosis, it's uh, great because you, this is a tool for measurement because then what you're going to do is you're going to look at all the goals that you have created. So for example, at the end of treatment, you're going to look at all the goals that you have created and you're going to see whether you're going to evaluate it. You're going to see whether you, the goal was met, unmet or partially met. So all the goals that you come up with should be measurable, should be, you know, a, it should be outlined in such a way that you can measure whether this was met or unmet or partially met. So let's look at this question. The delivery of preventive and therapeutic procedures specified in the care plan to meet a patient's needs defines, so what is that called? When you're actually delivering the preventive and therapeutic procedures, when you're actually educating the client, when you're doing preventive, like there are so many things we do preventive. Fluoride is prevention for caries. Um, education is prevention for further um, you know, so that they don't get they don't get more bioform. So we're educating them to prevent periodontal disease. Therapeutic are things we do so we can uh, debridement is therapeutic because we're helping them. Uh, fluoride could really also be considered therapeutic. Uh, polishing, right, is there is also a way to remove stains. So what are the procedure? Whatever we are doing falls under what? The correct answer is implementation because implementation is when we're debriding when we're offering education when we're doing fluoride when you're doing polishing all that nutritional counseling tobacco cessation all that falls under implementation you plan it out here and then when it's actually being done that is the implementation technique a section here's another question 
the um, preliminary phase of dental care planning focuses on which of the following preliminary phase of dental care planning? So it is C, treating periodontal or dental emergency needs. So there are phases of treatment. There's like phase one, phase two, um, you know, phase three, phase four. And there's even phase zero. Phase zero or preliminary phase of dental care is when you're tre treating emergency conditions only. So if there's a periodontal emergency, like a periodontal abscess, or if there's a dental emergency, like someone's in immense pain because of a cavity, that needs to, that's phase zero. That needs to be treated right away. Control and risk factors, that's phase one. I'll talk about that. Surgical is phase two. Long-term periodontal maintenance, that's phase four. So let's look at all the phases. There's five phases of periodontal treatment plan. So when you come up with a treatment plan, there's five phases. There's phase zero or prelim preliminary phase, which is just the um, assessment phase. You're collecting all the um, data, that's assessment, like extra oral, intra oral, that's phase zero. And any preliminary therapy, any emergency treatment can be in this section here, phase zero. Non-surgical periodontal therapy, this is what we do, okay? This is what we as hygienists do. We debride, that falls under here. We educate, that falls under here. We polish, that falls under here. So non-surgical periodontal therapy are things we can do, and I'll show you that in the next slide. Surgical therapy, this is when surgery, actual surgery is done. Restorative therapy, this is what dentists do. They put restorations and periodontal maintenance, that's phase four. So when we come, when they come and see us every three to four months for a recare appointment and we're just maintaining their periodontium and we're just making sure that their periodontitis doesn't get worse. So that's why we want to see them regularly. So if you look at this one, preliminary phase, this is the emergency care phase. You can see that um, it's all about pain relief, emergency needs, extraction of hopeless teeth. What we can do, the X means that this is what we can do. If we see anything, um, you know, if they're in pain, we need to refer them right away to the dentist or to a specialist. Non-surgical phase one therapy, so this is phase zero, this is phase one. You can see we can do almost everything. We can educate, we can do dietary counseling, we could do tobacco cessation, we can do fluoride, sealants, debridement. They all fall under non-surgical periodontal therapy. polishing um, and then evaluation is also part of phase one therapy so when we're when they come back for a four to six week re-eval for example and we'll, we're reassessing their inflammation their pocket depths their cal we're reassessing it we're reassessing their their oral self-care knowledge we're checking for deposits and we're coming up with a, a plan as to how often we should see them. Is it every three months? Is it four months? Is it six months? We're coming up with that plan. And as an FYI, any periodontal client who has periodontitis, we want to see them every three to four months. Any client that is healthy or has gingivitis, we want to see them every six months. Phase two is surgical therapy. We don't, you can see there's no X here because we don't do any surgical therapy. This is where they could see a periodontist. This is implants can also be done. Endodontics or root canal uh, treatment, they all fall under surgical. Restorative is when the dentist does any um, restorative care. So amalgam, composite, that sort of thing, crowns, bridges. Maintenance phase is phase four. So this we do where we get them to come back in three months from now, from now for example, and we assess all the conditions that are listed here. So when we de they come back three months later and you're debriding, you're providing prevention and therapeutic and periodontal maintenance therapy. So maintenance therapy is a term used for interventions directed at sustaining oral health and controlling disease progression. The application of occlusal sealant is an example of maintenance therapy. So look at the options and tell me what you think. So the actual answer is true. So maintenance therapy is when we are um, maintaining their oral health. So if they come every three to four months, we're maintaining their oral health that way. And that's, um, that, so this is correct. Maintenance therapy is a term used for interventions for sustaining or for keeping their oral health, you know, for a long period of time and controlling their 
uh, disease progression. The application of occlusal sealant is an example of maintenance therapy. So you might think, if you look over here, sealants fall under phase one therapy, right? So how can sealants be um, maintenance? Well, it could be maintenance if we are using it for prevention. If we're using any therapy, whether it be a therapeutic, for example, or preventive, can also go under maintenance. So if you see your client again in three months, in four months, in six months, for example, that would fall under um, maintenance phase because now what you're doing, everything further along, you're doing everything to prevent caries. You're doing everything to prevent periodontal disease. So it could also fall under this category as well. Sealants could also fall under here, can also fall under phase one therapy where you see them for the first time. Really important that we as hygienists are huge, are keen on interprofessional collaboration. Interprofessional collaboration means you are working with other professionals that are not hygienists. You're working with the dentist, you're working with the doctor, you're working with the pharmacist, you're working with, I don't know, the speech and language pathologist, all other social care worker, social workers, right? So all other professionals um, are who we're collaborating with to make sure that our client gets all their needs met. When you come up with a care plan, it's really important that we come up with um, a sequencing or an appointment schedule. So you would say appointment one, this is what you're gonna do. And how, um, so when you come up with an appointment schedule, maybe you need three appointments to see your client. Maybe you need five. So how many visits do you need? How much time will you need? Is it a two hour appointment? Is it a one hour appointment? Is it a half hour appointment? And what exactly are you doing in each appointment? So all of that needs to be listed in the appointment um, schedule. So appointment one, maybe you're doing assessment for one hour and you list all the assessment down. Appointment two, maybe you're doing more assessments, care plan, diagnosis, that will take an hour and a half. Appointment three is when you're doing the non-surgical therapy. So you're debriding, you're um, doing oral hygiene instruction, so you're educating. That all falls under non-surgical therapy. One thing I want to note is that when you're writing a goal, so one of the things we do is we always come up with goals for every unmet human need. So if we have an unmet human need, we will come up with a goal so that we can address that unmet human need. Now, when you're writing the goal, really important that you have all four components. You have the subject. So the subject is your client. Your patient, your client is your subject. You have a verb. What do you want the client to do? Understand, demonstrate, reduce, eliminate. Those are the verbs, so that needs to be incorporated into the goal statement. You have a criteria for measurement. So for example, they will reduce plaque index to less than 10%. So 10% is measurable. You can measure it. Um, they will demonstrate adequate flossing skills. So flossing skills, you can get them to demonstrate it again at the end and see if they, if they can actually properly demonstrate the correct C-shaped flossing method. And then a time dimension, the fourth uh, important thing is the time dimension. Always have by end of treatment, by next week care, you know, by appointment three, for example, you must have a time when the patient is to have achieved the goal. So again, the subject is always the patient or the patient's caregiver. For example, if it's a child, then it's up to the patient's caregiver, the parent. Um, a verb is the action that you want them to do. So understand, demonstrate. Criterion for measurement, this is what is the behavior you want? What is the tangible outcome? You want them to floss. You want them to reduce their plaque index. You want them to stop their bleeding, eliminate their bleeding. What is it that you want? And then time dimension is when should the patient have achieved the goal by? Is it by next appointment? Is it by next week or so the next time you see them three months from now? Is it by the end of treatment? So when you're finished treatment, you want them to know what periodontal disease is. When is it that you want them to know? So you would have to come up with that on your own. Just be sure that you come up, you have these four, um, things listed in your patient goals. Now, I know we tend to use client will verbalize, client will demonstrate, but there's so many other ones that you can use for verbs. So these are just an example of other verbs that could be used.
when you have come up with your entire care plan, you must present it to your client. You can't proceed with treatment without presenting it to your client and getting their consent. So when you do that care plan presentation and you're talking to your client about it, make sure you tell them about all these things. Tell them about the benefits of doing it and the risk of doing it. So with debridement, there's the risk of sensitivity. So you need to inform them about that. Um, if they don't want, let's say, one of the things you talked about was missing teeth and they don't want an implant. Well, what are the other alternative treatment options that they can get? Could they get a bridge? Could they get a denture? What else could you do for missing teeth? So you need to give them all options. And then informed consent is what you need to get from them. They need to um, agree to the treatment or they can disagree and we'll talk about that too which is informed refusal so informed consent is when you get their permission to uh, proceed it's when you get their consent for a specific treatment and it is illegal um it, it's you need, you, need, you need to get consent for a procedure that is legal that is within your scope of practice what is important is it has to be informed. So informed is not a one-time activity, but it's ongoing, which means you don't tell them once. You keep telling them, you know, you might want to review it again at each appointment that, you know, I have your permission to do this. You, you know, we went over the risk and benefits and review the risk and benefits with them. We went over the cost, tell them what the cost is and allow them the opportunity to ask questions. It should be where they are given lots and lots of opportunities to make, uh, to ask you questions. Okay, so it shouldn't just be a one-way conversation, it should be a two-way conversation. Informed refusal, there are times where clients will refuse fluoride, where clients will refuse you know, uh, a few uh, treatments that you have uh, provided for them. So it's okay if that happens, listen to them, um, and then uh, respect their decisions for declining the, service, the services. And if they do refuse, make sure you get that in, in um, make sure you get that in writing. So sign, get that signed or at least document it that the client has refused, but get them to sign something so that it's part of their client dental record. So you, as long as you've given them the benefits and the risk, if they still decide to refuse it, that is okay. Just make sure it's documented. The last part of ADPI, or one of the last part of ADPI, is E for evaluation. So now you have to evaluate all the goals that you made. And one of the things we talked about at the very beginning of um, our session was that it's ongoing. And as we see from this slide here, evaluation is not necessarily done at the end. It can be done after assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation. We're always evaluating. We're evaluating as we um, go along the, you know, with their treatment. So evaluation is ongoing. I'm just going to find that slide that I was at. Okay, so it's ongoing. When you're evaluating, let's say, um, make sure you ask open-ended questions. So if they, if you wanted to, one of the, let's say one of the goals was, do they know the periodontal disease process? You're not going to ask them, do you know what periodontal disease is? And they'll say yes or no. No, you're going to tell, ask them, tell me what you know about periodontal disease. So now you're asking, you're assessing their cognitive skills. You're a goal. It's a cognitive goal because you're assessing their knowledge. Open-ended questions are, is the best way, not simple yes or no um, questions. Have the client demonstrate. So if one of your goal was to get the client to demonstrate the C-shaped flossing method, get them to demonstrate it. That is a psychomotor goal because they're using their hands. Um, it could be uh, having a patient report a change in behaviors. So perhaps they don't, you know, they never used to go to uh, see a dentist. They didn't realize it was so important in seeing a dentist. And now they actually tell you, you know what, I'm going to come see you every six months or I'm going to come see you every three months because now I know how important that is. That is an effective, effective goal. So you're changing their behavior. That is the goal of whether you've implemented behavioral change. And then showing the patient clinical um, improvements. This is an oral health st status goal. So at the evaluation, you might want to take a post-op photo, of, uh, sorry, this pre up in post-op photos and show them the before and after and when they see that when they see that the gums have become a lot more healthier and there's less bleeding that is an oral health status goal so evaluation is good not only for yourself to see your treatment work but also for the client so that the client has also seen the effectiveness and the importance of you know them see going to the dentist regularly so each of the goals that you have listed in your care plan, make sure you determine whether the goal has been met, somewhat met, or not met. 
So there are um, sometimes goals have not been met. If the patient, if you had like an interdental cleaning aid that you wanted them to use and they weren't able to pr correctly position it. So that next time when you come around, you can look at this and you're like, okay, this is what we need to work on. And now documentation is huge. And you all know that documentation, this is a legal document and it's very important that we are writing each and everything down because if we didn't write it it's as if it didn't happen right so always document everything 